Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us today for our online session on the rise of informal volunteer due to the COVID-19 crisis. My name is Raida Mana and I am a member of the AAVE team. We hope you're safe and healthy during these disturbing times. As the coronavirus pandemic continues affecting our world, IAVE is committed to help volunteers and volunteer organizations deal with the challenges it presents. We have prepared a series of webinars and resources to help you best respond to this crisis, including the IAVE COVID-19 Response Fund to support volunteer-led preparedness, containment, response, and recovery activities. This fund will help you ensure, will help ensure volunteering organizations have resources to keep critical volunteer efforts strong in this type of such great needs. To learn more about how to donate to the fund or to apply for a grant, please visit us at iave.org slash COVID-19. IAVE strives to build an inclusive network open to individuals and organizations of all capacities and resources. Please, vis please visit us at our website to learn more about how to become a member and follow us on social media. The response from people wanting to help with the COVID-19 crisis has been overwhelming. Much of this has been about people simply wanting to do something helpful for their neighbors. This rise in informal volunteering is appreciated, but also at times challenging as individuals stepping forward to help are not linked to an organization or institution. And there is no support to them as volunteering, volunteers, including keeping them safe. Today we'll hear from Stuart Gartland of Volunteer in Ireland and Ksenia Fonovic of CSV Lazio in Italy as they share what their organizations are doing to guide and support both formal and informal volunteer efforts. A couple of important announcements as we start. This webinar is being recorded and we will be and it will be available in our COVID-19 response website at iave.org slash COVID-19. For questions or comments, please type them in the question box and our moderator will convey them to our presenters. I'd like to start by introducing our moderator for today's session, George Thompson. George is the Chief Executive Officer of Volunteer Scotland, the National Center for Volunteer Development in the country, working in the areas of research, policy and practice. His career has been centered on citizen engagement in all forms of volunteer activity and in all sectors. He really enjoys working in, as he calls it, the feel-good industry. Thank you, George, for leading today's session and welcome everyone. Hello, <clears throat> thank you very much, <clears throat> Rieda. I'm George and I'm delighted to be your moderator for this webinar. Thank you everybody for joining us for this. I understand that there are perhaps as many as 300 participants from 74 countries across the world and so a very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, it's very difficult times, I, I know, for everybody just now. So uh, an even more special thanks for taking the time to join in on this uh, presentation, this webinar today. And I think a special thanks to our speakers, Xenia and um, Stuart, for preparing their presentations to us, which I'm very much looking forward to hearing in a moment or two. So by setting a little bit of context for you, uh, just as you've said, Rieda, that there's been this most magnificent and wonderful um, human reaction to this crisis. And isn't it fantastic to witness in a world which has seemed to become so distrustful of our institutions and in our uh, daily lives, to see this wonderful trusting environment generated where people in their community spirit 
have been so helpful, so generous and so kind. And I think it is really worthwhile that IAVI have put this webinar together for us to try and observe and understand what's been happening, but also for us to reflect a little as well about what does it mean for us in our volunteer engagement and volunteer development work as we move forward. So I think in some senses, this responding to the rise of informal volunteers, I would put in two ways. One, what is the opportunity that that gives rise to, that we can build upon and connect with and, and nurture for all the good that it brings, but also perhaps there's a threat side as well. What are the threats that might arise if we don't make sure that um, things are done safely and that we don't not recognise that there are risks associated with perhaps being overly trusting, for instance. So let's look at the threats and the opportunities and then I look forward to hearing your questions and for us to have some debate and dialogue after the presentations. So thank you for that opportunity to set the context and now I'll just simply ask for Ksenia Fonovic from Italy, from CSV Lazio region, to make her presentation. Hello, I just wanted to put my face on this presentation to thank you for coming to listen also because after two months for the first time I put on a, a real a real shirt. Um, I'm talking to you from uh, Roma, Italy it was hardly hit uh, by the COVID crisis as everybody knows. Uh, we are a regional volunteer support center uh, infrastructure for volunteering in Italy is quite structured and strong. So uh, uh, we have people working all over the region. We are about 55 staff. And uh, from one day to the other, we put all people to work from home without any preparation or technical equipment. But it's working and it's working very well. Uh, with associations and people around uh, are continuous and strong and um, I think this is um, this is a very important learning opportunity for us uh, uh, as organization um, as it is the, um, the dealing with you know, what we hear the rise uh, the upsurge of uh, informal voluntary but uh, first, uh, um, I think I need to make you understand what uh, informal volunteering means for us. First thing, it's quite new. For 20 years as Volunteer Support Centre, we have been dealing primarily, if not exclusively, with uh, organised volunteering. So. Uh, Dealing with uh, and finding ways to support and interact with um, informal volunteering uh, um, is a challenge, not only because it uh, entails uh, just modifying some services or putting new words in our vocabulary, because it really calls for an evolution of the organizational uh, culture, not only in terms of services, but also on uh, how we interpret our mission, because um, I don't know if it's uh, the same everywhere, but uh, in Italy, a volunteer in organization is not just an um, unpaid hand to do things. Um, volunteers are members of the association and uh, participate in the whole democratic life of the organization, in the decision-making processes, uh, in uh, organizing and deciding things. So uh, whatever we do in terms of um, support to volunteers uh, in organization is actually instrumental to what we see as our uh, core mission, which is uh, supporting volunteering as a form of uh, democratic uh, life. Um, 
And then this is the first uh, challenge that I wanted to share with you in terms of our learning about ourselves and about volunteering during this uh, uh, crisis um, is uh, to understand and understand how to relate and support uh, the informal volunteering as a, a way of uh, an expression of new forms uh, of uh, citizens' uh, um, democracy. Um, as you see uh, in the slide, informal, direct and individual volunteering are often used as the uh, synonyms. Uh, it's important to transfer that uh, uh, we have a more nuanced uh, understanding because uh, direct volunteering, and it's important uh, about uh, um, talking and thinking about our work. Direct volunteering is uh, something that a single person does on his own for another person or for common good, also in advocacy issues. Uh, uh, when we speak about informal volunteering, it's more about people getting together to do something for their immediate community, uh, usually, without getting um, themselves into a formal organization such as uh, association or committee. And it is precisely this type of uh, um, community, non-formalized self-organization that uh, we see really flowering uh, in this uh, in this crisis. So, uh, what do informal volunteers do? Uh, um, essentially, uh, bringing groceries uh, to the people bound at home, mainly elderly or others in uh, difficult situations, because uh, um, for two months. Uh, now people are allowed to go out only for grocery shopping and um, also providing uh, food and other essential uh, uh, needs to a um, fastly rising number of people and uh, families uh, who for the first time in their lives uh, are in a difficult uh, economic uh, situation. Um, It's okay, we're doing good. Okay. Um, so this is this is what happened um, immediately uh, after the lockdown, in a moment uh, where also voluntary <laughs> organizations were under stress and flabbergasted by being confined uh, uh, at home. Uh, fortunately, many young people uh, took to the streets uh, uh, immediately, um, and uh, this is. The second uh, challenge or thought that I wanted to share with you. Uh, traditionally, uh, Italian uh, volunteering is made of uh, ma mature age people, and uh, there are not very many young people in structured voluntary organizations. Uh, uh, all this uh, informal help is. Uh, on the shoulders, on the hands, uh, in the hands uh, of uh, people quite uh, quite young. So um, what we see here that this may be in a way the new, hopefully, probably, maybe in the future, the new great generation of volunteering because uh, um, the people that are leaders now of uh, organized volunteering that made up the volunteer support centers and uh, essentially uh, invented and uh, took on their shoulders the, the modern Italian volunteering is a generation of uh, hippies who in 66 when uh, Florence uh, was flooded uh, rushed uh, there to save uh, the books and uh, and um, and paintings. So um, I think it's important for us as volunteer centers to um, take in a bigger picture and uh, think uh, in a historical perspective uh, uh, what this answer of solidarity on the ground uh, in a time of such a harsh uh, 
uh, crisis is um, will will raise will breed uh, for the future. The third point uh, is that uh, uh, the it's it's not it's important that in in the title of the webinar we find uh, this term neighborhood. Uh, it's a, a fundamental aspect uh, um, because uh, things work uh, and people get taken care of uh, if uh, there are different groups and public institutions and uh, um, commercial actors and single citizens uh, uh, have the possibility of possibly structured framework uh, to chip, chip, chip in and uh, do a part. Uh, um, in some places, it's in terms of sharing uh, a, a, a good practice, a good thing that uh, we are uh, seeing and uh, are very much supporting as a, as a volunteer uh, center, is the local networks coordinated by the public institution, the lowest one, the municipality, in our case, uh, that uh, provides a platform for associations uh, already established uh, and working. Uh, uh, um, availability of informal volunteers uh, to um, do the to do the the street work uh, uh, in uh, and initiatives such as um, suspended groceries. There are in many places. So the possibility also for people when they go to the supermarket or to the market or to the um, pharmacy uh, uh, to buy things um, for the people in need, leave them and then volunteers then uh, distribute uh, to whoever needs uh, the, um, the food or stuff uh, uh, in the neighborhood. So uh, when there is uh, an uh, authentic institution open to collaboration with uh, citizens groups uh, uh, the community calls uh, um, and this is a winning factor i think also uh, in terms of uh, what can provide an uh, infrastructure possibility for informal volunteers uh, to to do their uh, to do their part uh, um, but um, um, like in, in this country, this is not uh, the standard. Uh, the dialogue with the uh, uh, public institutions is, uh, not, is not easy. So um, this I see very much in terms of uh, challenge also for our uh, future work. Um, finally, the a core thing that I wanted to tell you is uh, about some things that we did as volunteer center during uh, um, the crisis and um, with some problems that we had um, because uh, it's not easy to do anything in uh, in the situation of the lockdown so first problem like day one the author authorization for the mobility of volunteers. Uh, lockdown was only you can go to work if you are in essential services uh, and go to get food, uh, uh, not every day. Uh, so um, we worked with the regional authority and uh, um, a, a, a dedicated ordinance nor no regulation was issued that uh, provided the institutional framework for volunteers to be out uh, in the street uh, um, for doing the volunteering services that were uh, specified in terms of uh, um, first necessities. Um, the other problem, this also day one, and it will not finish uh, so soon, is the issue of um, uh, security. Uh, the, the personal security, the sanitary norms uh, on uh, how to be 
out there in the world uh, without uh, harming yourself or uh, anybody else. So uh, on uh, this, we started uh, immediately to do a lot of uh, information, uh, training. We did uh, webinars with our doctor on uh, also starting from very simple things. Uh, what masks you um, need, how to wear the gloves, uh, how to come to the door to the to the people. And um, this this was very uh, important. Uh, um, how to wear the mask? It was just uh, uh, thinking of future because when we started, uh, not that there was a shortage of masks. Uh, there there were none, and it was a big problem. Uh, the other big problem is uh, insurance, and it's there is no solution uh, for this. If if anybody out there in the world. Uh, has a good insurance in COVID times, please write to me and let me see the conditions. Because uh, actually we couldn't find a good arrangement for uh, the insurance companies uh, to cover the biological hazard for volunteers. Uh, because it is virtually impossible to determine that you got the virus while doing volunteering instead of uh, while doing the, um, the shopping. For informal volunteers, um, the problem was uh, much greater because they didn't have even the ordinary insurance that organized uh, volunteers have. So um, to, to address uh, this uh, problem, we worked with structured uh, voluntary organizations, seeing if uh, um, the informal volunteers in their local networks uh, um, could be registered uh, as uh, their volunteers. Uh, it's 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 not an easy thing uh, to understand uh, what could be a good system of support for this. Um, of course, then we did uh, all business uh, as uh, usual, working very much uh, on uh, uh, also on putting a lot of training uh, online. But most of all, we work very much uh, on information uh, on our web website, uh, we did the uh, videos, so uh, um, continuously all the micro news of what associations uh, were um, doing uh, across the regions and what the needs were. Um, and of course also all the information about the um, regulations and uh, norms and uh, technical problems. So uh, um, it, it, it was a way of our keeping our presence and support uh, alive uh, continuously. And this also hooked uh, uh, a good number of uh, informal uh, volunteers who were not in contact with us before. Um, finally, uh, one service I want to point out uh, that uh, we um, really had to change as uh, the lockdown uh, came, and it is our matching service. Um, we had to change the way of uh, talking and giving orientation to people who called and wanted to volunteer. And the first thing, it was more in the line of uh, dissuading, are you sure? Because the, the first duty of every volunteer is to be a good citizen. So uh, our first mandate was to keep uh, home. And um, the final word, uh, the issue of proximity uh, emerged uh, uh, very strongly. So we tried to uh, orient uh, people to um, uh, groups uh, or initiatives uh, or associations or collective structures that uh, needed uh, uh, help uh, from uh, new volunteers and were ready to accept them uh, as much as possible close to home so not uh, not anything that you can't uh, walk to um i think my time is over mm -hmm. i transferred you the titles of uh, what are my uh, questions so um of course uh, i would be happy to go on talking about this forever but uh, thank you for listening so far Okay, Ksenia, thank you very much. <clears throat> I think um, 
you've risen to this occasion because I think on listening to you <clears throat> and hearing about how uh, the citizens have responded, I think in simple, plain and in human ways. And I think your presentation has been plain, simple, concrete and very helpful to us. So <clears throat> I thank you for that. <clears throat> and I do think that there's something when we come to our discussion about the way in which uh, our communities have spontaneously responded to need, they've organised themselves simply, and they've gotten on with the job. I think there's so much about that that we can take forward as we move through things. So thanks again, Ksenia. So now I would, it's my pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague of mine, Stuart Garland. We've known each other for some time from Volunteer Ireland. I, I do have to say though, the photograph of him in this presentation is one I recognize from when I first met him 10 years ago. So I'm not saying anything more than that other than maybe a more up-to-date photo would be warranted, Stuart. But having said that, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say on this subject. So over to you. Thanks, George. Uh, always good to hear your voice and your, your comedic style. Hello, everyone. And um, thanks very much for, for joining us today. Uh, this is the same offending photograph that George is talking about. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I tell, you, <laughs> I tell you, in Ireland, we, 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 have, uh, we have spring water here and it keeps us eternally young. Um, so it's, it's nice to have you all um, on, on, on the SWIT webinar today. Um, a few of the things I want to take you through in this session is to look a little bit back at where informal volunteering has come from. And the reason to look back, I suppose, is that we can look forward. Um, one of the, the questions I think that's around is, is, is we're in many challenges at the moment, but what will those challenges be in nine or 12 months time? And the challenge will be for us to engage new volunteers. And maybe we, as Senya was saying this, is we look to these informal volunteers and engaging them in our programs. But in Ireland and, and across a lot of the European countries, we have a very formal in uh, volunteering infrastructure. And our organizations are probably even more formal than that. So while in Volunteer Ireland, we're encouraging people to get involved in informal volunteering, uh, there's a lot of resistance there from the organization. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of the history that we're, we're sharing with our organizations at the moment, uh, just a very compact little version of it, and tell you a little bit of the ways that we're supporting volunteering involving organizations to encourage them to look at their own volunteer programs at the moment to see if they can change them if they can adapt, if they can encourage those informal volunteers to join them. And the challenge might be is that for a lot of those organizations, the way that they have been doing things hasn't changed in a long time. They're still very much of the belief that volunteers should come every Tuesday. Uh, it, it should happen at the exact same time. Well, we know in, in a lot of countries that people uh, are, are, are showing preference for episodic volunteering. They want to have that little bit of flexibility involved and what we're trying to do is what we have been trying to do for, for a number of years is introduce people to micro volunteering informal volunteering virtual volunteering and encouraging organizations to take a few of those ideas on board so i suppose the difference that we talk about is that piece of the difference between the formal and the informal and when we look at, at the formal volunteering what we're talking about is that working with organizations where through the informal piece it's probably not the best in terms of those who are the most vulnerable in society and require complex or longer term and again our concern is that there is a liability around those informal volunteers so we want to protect them as much as we possibly can a little bit like what Senya was saying is we have been lucky um, to get some insurance in terms of protecting the volunteers but again, we cannot protect them in terms of getting COVID-19 and, and, and it would be very hard to prove that in, in, in a court if it was ever to go that way. And when we look a little bit back, there isn't a lot of, there isn't a lot of research that's done um, or there's a small amount of research that's done in terms of informal volunteering and looking at some of the definitions that are there for it. Um, there's a lot less definitions for informal volunteering than there is, let's say, for formal volunteering. And while we would probably use the UN definition, this is, I suppose, the one that we've adopted here in Ireland in terms of, uh, again, unpaid volunteering, not coordinated by an organization or an institution, evidence in helping individuals outside one's household, informal political participation, informal religious activity, 
a membership in informal mutual assistance groups. And that's what we've we've seen here in Ireland is a lot of informal volunteering happening uh, on, on a person's road in terms of the mobility in Ireland. People aren't allowed to travel more than two kilometers from their house and it's not encouraged. Uh, so one of the things that we're trying to do is, is get that informal to take place in someone's local area. And um, that's the important piece in terms of how we can encourage that as much as we possibly can. In terms of the framework that's there for it to actually happen, I suppose, is that it is very much around people taking turns, helping one another. So it, there, there is that reciprocal piece of someone helping that may help someone else back. At the beginning of, uh, of our lockdown, if you want to call it that in Ireland, uh, within a matter of two days, we had about seven and a half thousand people um, who registered on our national database, IVOL, to volunteer. And that's grown now to around about 13,000 people. So the difficulty is, is that a lot of the formal volunteering isn't going on at the moment. And one of the challenges is that people are very keen and anxious and they want to get out and to do the volunteering. So what message we need to get out to them is that this isn't just for this week or for next week. It's, it's, it's for a longer term than that. We don't, we don't know how long it is, um, but we will need them not just today and tomorrow, but we will need them to support people in their local communities, whether that's going to the pharmacies or the shops to get pieces for them. Um, what we do see, I suppose, is that there's two forms of informal volunteering classified in two types, person orientated and task orientated. And the breakdown of those are the person orientated is helping someone like a homeless person, a hungry person, a child or a teen, a disabled person or immigrant includes helping one's neighbour or bringing people together. While as on the task orientated side, it could be taking care of animals or pets. And we've seen that is, is quite an interesting one here in Ireland where a lot of the people who are cocooning or isolating at home, a lot of those older people, a lot of them tend to have pets because they're living in isolation. And it's now uh, getting volunteers to bring out those uh, pets and, and bring them out for a walk where possible. Yard work, shopping, appointments, helping with business, making food and doing some home renovations too as well. So it breaks down into those categories. And while it is formal, informal volunteering, this at a local level is being managed and supported by our local volunteer centre network working with the local municipality too as well to find out what are the needs in each particular area and how they can actually be supported. Globally, when we look at it, um, we can see that 70% globally is informal volunteering compared to 30%, uh, which is formal, making up the equivalent, full-time equivalent of 109 million. So in Ireland, again, uh, like some of our European colleagues, a lot of the volunteering that goes on is, is formal. It's very hard to find out about that informal piece and what we're trying to do now is educate, teach people, whether that's through webinars, through fact sheets, and you can download those on, from our website, but trying to get people to understand this, not to see informal volunteering as, oh, you know, it, it is to a certain extent, it's, it's not as highly screened or it's not as, as, as highly managed and people feel concerned about that. But what we're saying is this is an audience of people that we could reach out to and engage the interesting thing, I suppose, is that it predates our formal volunteering uh, infrastructures that we've had um, and a lot of those in the industrialized countries. And again, there's this that suggestion there from Haid again to say that informal volunteering, particularly in, in instinctive as an aspect of behavior genetics uh, among human beings, not learned behavior, which is present in more of the, uh, the industrialized cultures. So some of the key issues that are there, I suppose, is that piece around measurement. It's very, very difficult to uh, measure exactly informal volunteering because people don't say, well, I volunteer with something. They tend to say, I, I give a hand. It takes place very sporadically. It might you know, just be someone helping someone out and just the language that we use. So it's quite difficult to actually measure that piece. But there has been a study done in the States and the found people re uh, reported almost three times as much informal volunteering in their time diaries as they did of formal volunteering. If we look at the top 10 for formal volunteering in the World Giving Index, again, you can see those countries there, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Sudan, Canada, Kuwait, Guyana, United, oh, United States, Kenya, Australia, Colombia, and New Zealand tied for the 10th place. So we're not seeing, I suppose, the traditional countries that we see in terms of the formal volunteering, where formal volunteering would be quite strong. Informal is, is with the exception possibly there of the United States us, uh, and New Zealand's Australia in there. And just to look at a few of those examples around the world in terms of what's happening. So in South Africa, formal and informal volunteering exist in a situation of some conflict. 
informal representing traditional society and the formal operating as a less popular and largely state sanctioned activity. In Kazakhstan, 55% of respondents provided assistance to individuals they knew personally. It was a survey of 1,200 respondents. In Mexico, a national representative study found that two thirds of adults engaging in some form of volunteering, again, evenly split about 50-50 between formal and informal volunteering. In the Philippines, a focus group of uh, people there revealed that respondents spent on average five hours per week in formal volunteering and 8.2 hours per week in informal uh, volunteering. And finally, a national representative study and survey found in Russia found 50% of respondents received assistance from individuals they knew personally. So some of the things that we're trying to do, I suppose, is work with informal volunteers and trying to encourage them to look for good practice. So while they might be coming together as, as a group of people in a local community, we want them, I suppose, to understand a few different things. So again, first of all, is that for the people who are self-isolating in their home, they may not have been uh, meeting people for any period of time. They might be living in isolation. So they might be very nervous about opening their door. So we're encouraging people to write a short note to introduce themselves, include their telephone number. If the person doesn't get back to them, that's absolutely fine. Like that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But it might be just that that person doesn't feel comfortable with that person. We're trying to encourage people to do that in their local, in their local areas around that. We're encouraging our volunteers not to enter the home unless absolutely necessary. Again, if they're dropping off shopping or a prescription, call or text the person to let them know. And that's been supported through our local municipalities and making sure that people practice social distancing in terms of two meters keeping distance. Again, if the person is ill or sick in any way, that they shouldn't come forward to volunteer. The priority now is around stopping the spread of COVID-19. So again, that they follow all the health service instructions around that. In terms of supporting those informal groups, what we're trying to do is, I suppose, is, is for people to realise that there's a huge interest in informal volunteering at the moment. And a lot of those people may not necessarily come forward. There might be that knee-jerk reaction. Particularly, a lot of the engagement was, first of all, was online through Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, other different social media channels. So people were very keen and very interested to get involved, but it's about managing those expectations. So the, having a clear role description for any, whether it's an informal or a formal volunteering, make sure that everyone is reaching the same goal and provides clarity in deciding who is or isn't suitable for the role. And thirdly there, again, is that the number of volunteers may be greater than the number of people looking for help. So again, that's a little bit of the challenge that we've had in Ireland at the moment is where volunteers are saying these new informed, there was nothing for me to do when in fact there is, but it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it might be a week down the road before or a month before we actually know what the exact need is, will be. The piece I suppose we do want to share, I suppose, is there are lots of challenges and stresses that are there around volunteering at this particular time. So we've developed two fact sheets, for one for volunteer managers and one for volunteers with Mental Health Ireland in terms of people being aware of those particular strains and stresses that are there right now. And one of the things we're saying is that some of those things may not, we may not realize them now at the moment. We, we have volunteers that are working about two kilometers from here um, in one of our testing centers where they're test, uh, it's a drive-in test center. And we've got volunteers that are manning two of those centers. And what we're saying is to those volunteers, they're, they're doing a great, amazing work, but it might be that we need to support them in six or nine months time when they look back on their volunteering and they reflect back and they go, I wonder how many people that came through that testing center have actually died, have passed away. And it might hit them as that post-traumatic stress, but it may not happen for six or nine months later. So we've been working closely with the government in terms of making sure that we can get those supports in place for people in the future as well. Again, to encourage volunteers to be aware of their own circumstances. And while there are at risk categories, again, it's just to realize in terms of the stress and the strain um, and people wanting to volunteer is just that they're slowing themselves down and taking at their pace. Everybody wants to do things. People are feeling, they're feeling challenged that they're being at home and, and there's these challenges that are there against them and it's trying to work with them. The most important thing I suppose that we all need to realize is that in an emergency or a disaster situation doesn't mean that we should drop all our usual volunteer screening protections in place and we must do our utmost to protect the most vulnerable in our societies and that's the important piece that we can do. This is the fact sheet that we've got along with lots of others which is available from our, our website volunteer.ie and if anyone wants to get in to download those we've got some trainings that are there 
online or you can watch them too as well we'd be delighted to share them with you so thank you all i hope you found it useful there's my uh, contact details and email address if you want to get in contact with us and uh, thanks for joining us back to you george thank you <clears throat> thank you very much stuart um, that was a really accomplished very clear very helpful presentation also very wise which gets back to that age thing but we'll leave that for the moment <laughs> Um, I wonder, we've now, we're now going to open things up to all the participants and I can see that we've got a large number of you. So um, I'm not at this point aware of any questions that any of you are wishing to ask. Um, I was going to kick things off perhaps just by um, focusing in on one big question for me and then once I've put that out perhaps people can um, put a message in of, of a question or that they want to come in and voice the question that they've got so you have to indicate that to me at the moment I can't see anybody any of you wishing to come in so the question I'd like to put to uh, Stuart and Ksenia and to you all is that there's this remarkable what you say supply side this wonderful interest of people to want to help um, Stuart you mentioned I think about the 15,000 here at Volunteer Scotland there was a request made and we've now got over 50,000 people that have come forward that want to help so we've got this tremendous supply side but the greatest weakness is the demand side now you can understand that at this point in time with lockdown, then the demand side is fairly limited. However, um, there's no clarity as yet about how that demand will increase over time and the kinds of things that we would like to engage our, our, our volunteers in. So um, what's the position in Italy and in Ireland about thinking about the different phases of the crisis? And what kind of activities do you think you may well be able to invite people to participate in further down the line? Have you any thoughts on that for us? Um, I suppose one of the things that we're looking at is encouraging people in Ireland to look at, at virtual volunteering right now. Um, our concern is that a lot of programmes when, when our, our lockdown came, uh, overnight they just closed um, and mm. an email went out to the to, from those organizations to say due to government restrictions we're, we're not taking on any volunteers and our big concern is that they've literally said bye-bye to all their volunteers without actually knowing it and and we're concerned mm. is that, you know you should keep that communication up so that that's I, I think is the first important piece is that they keep those communication channels open uh, the concern would be where some of those volunteers are older um, or more mature that I think this will give them a little bit of time to reflect on their volunteering and, and they may decide that because of the politics of the organization or what's happening in society at the moment that they, they don't feel they want to return to volunteering or they don't feel safe out in mm. society or even if the government says we can all travel tomorrow i don't think everyone's going to get on a plane tomorrow and um, there'll be lots of questions that, that people True. will ask so we're, we're all very sure that it, it that it's safe other people will travel but what i suppose we're trying to do is encourage those organizations to look at how they're volunteering at the moment and, and what they can possibly do it in the future a at the moment if it is possible if there are tasks that can be done virtually if there's work that can be done remotely and um, by computer by by some of the volunteer programs and, and we know that's that's happening we have other programs mm -hmm. which have gone from uh, i think just over 500 volunteers they have now around about 8000 uh, volunteers uh, which are telephoning all the older people um, an organization called alone and they've had that huge growth where they've had to go from training maybe a group of 20 people where now they're in that level of, of that mass numbers of volunteers mm. and, and getting them in, in, involved and getting them trained is, is a particular challenge but into the future I, I think it's that bit of us all looking and reflecting at going what what volunteering was is not what volunteering is going to be in, mm. in, in six or 12 months time and, and we all have a, an opportunity to to input into that. Mm. 
Sure, I think you're absolutely right with that. I just wonder if, if I may, before asking Ksenia to come in, um, you've, yeah, you're vol vol I... on you go, sorry, on you go. I confirm this is what we are seeing and it's actually a very strong already now demand side uh, from associations and uh, from certain categor categories of uh, uh, beneficiaries, uh, uh, young people, people with disabilities, uh, elderly, uh, the specific um, groups with uh, specific needs. And um, this is what uh, we have seen like from uh, after the very first moment in uh, which uh, a couple of days that nobody knew what to do, uh, the majority of associations that we are talking to continuously put in place a kind of um, action research of uh, actually listening uh, on uh, how associations uh, are uh, remodulating their uh, activities with volunteers. And it is really fantasy on power. Uh, because uh, associations in taking care of uh, even small groups or very specific issues uh, are inventing ways uh, uh, with uh, very little digital literacy and uh, technological capacity and uh, issues of connections and everything. Uh, mm. But uh, volunteers are inventing and keeping alive ways to keep in the relationship with their usual um, group of uh, beneficiaries. Yeah. So, Wonderful. Um, yeah. um, animation moments uh, with uh, the, um, I don't know, uh, group, um, youngsters with uh, autism or uh, um, reading stories uh, um, on um, in, in, in video conference. Uh, um keeping up the it's uh and also uh, very much the helplines uh, and uh, the listening uh, thing the socializing thing so um there is um demand uh, on uh, from associations for volunteers to um uh, to be active in in remote uh, as we call it uh, rather than because uh, it's a way to um, contrast the Social uh, distancing, and I think we will work very much on this in the in in the coming period. Uh, uh, and the need is great, also because um, uh, people are not very well prepared to master the digital technology. One okay, second, so I so say, can I? Big problem, I see. Can I take no? The demand side in the coming months will be for yeah. volunteers in the street because people will progressively uh, go back to work. And uh, the need for uh, food and support will remain for months. Done. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So thank you for that. Um, I still don't see any questions. I don't know, Reda, are you aware of anybody flagging up a question for um, us three? I might just come in there just while, while we're waiting for a question, just to, to an opposite side of, to, to what Sanya said. We've had mm -hmm. some organizations um, and quite interestingly where they have said, and I, I know every culture and every country is very, very different, but it was uh, another organization that was dealing with older volunteers and they had said they had a lot of resistance and challenge to connecting to technology uh, with the volunteers. And the volunteer manager was finding that challenge of trying to reach out to all these people was quite hard and trying to, it was impossible because they had over 200 volunteers. And since, the lockdown, uh, he had volunteers that were coming to them and they were saying, oh, we've, we've heard about this Zoom webinar. What, what, what is this? And he was going, oh, this is, well, can we use it? And what he's found is that the, the willingness was there. Now, I know it, depending on broadband and internet connections and all of these things, but he said it was a complete change from beforehand people were going, oh no, it's, it's technology and they wanted to have that, um, they wanted to have that engagement piece that they weren't having before that now all of a sudden that they were they were willing to engage with it so it was it was quite interesting to hear that change thank you Stuart so I, I was going to ask you um, because of the experience that volunteer Ireland has particularly around the organized volunteering world and you know you've got excellence in volunteer management for instance what opportunity do you see there for the organizations you've normally been working 
with to make a bridge and a link to this phenomenal growth in community-based, if you like, bottom-up, democratic participation and desire to volunteer, to give time for others. Do you see there's a potential and an opportunity for both those worlds, the formal and informal worlds, um, to overlap and to find benefits from each other? I think there's definitely an interest. I think definitely people are willing to change, but I, I know that not everyone is willing to change. And I think that the challenge is right now that a lot of the volunteer managers themselves, the organizations aren't operating, they have no funding streams so that are not able to pay their staff. So they're missing out on the time now where organizations have volunteer managers and that those are not necessarily all paid. Some of them are volunteers themselves, but they're taking the time to reflect and hear mm. what's going on. So when we're going back and we're sharing what we hear on on, on this webinar with them, they're they're like they're like uh, they're like mice after 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 a piece of cheese. <laughs> and they're going, tell me more. I, I want to know more. <laughs> Okay. And, and that's a really, that's a really positive thing, but we do know yeah. that we're only getting a very small group of those. And our, our concern and the sector's concern, I think, in Ireland is that a lot of these will not be around in you know in 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 in, in a year's time. Eight, their volunteer program might have closed, but they're they're not having the stream in terms of uh, money or funding that's coming into them. Okay, um, Kisanya, um, you mentioned about. Um, what you've observed about the lack of formal structures and how this uh, community orientated, this uh, you know, um, neighbourly and informal uh, rising of activity. So without the normal constitutions or incorporation, um, they, they don't have that. But are, can you help us to understand how does the decision making processes how are they working amongst those citizens and how are they dealing with conflicts that will inevitably arise when you get people together there will be differences on what's the best way forward so have we got any insights just yet about how the internal decision making and the relationships how are they working without the normal structures to support them? I, um, so from, from what I am uh, I'm seeing, hmm, there are many experience, recent, ex I don't know, a couple, some years experiences uh, of um, this non-formalized but organized uh, Types mm -hmm. of uh, community uh, initiatives. Uh, uh, um, not so recent, like um, uh, an example is uh, groups uh, of um, solidary buying, um, um, like people getting together to get uh, directly um, the food from producers uh, uh, and making the distribution in the in the neighborhood. Uh, or um, more recently, uh, people getting together, groups of people non formalized getting together to um, to clean um, parts of the of the neighborhood or uh, uh, or street um, and progressively uh, uh, this type of uh, groups then uh, tend to give themselves some kind of organization uh, because uh, uh, when it becomes uh, something um, stable over time and involves uh, more than you and me, uh, um, there is need to give yourself um, uh, a way of taking decisions and doing things uh, together and also of uh, uh, proposing to the outside uh, your ideas and, uh, uh, and vision. Not dissimilar of how uh, the um, committees of uh, parents or parental groups in the neighborhood uh, uh, developed. An interesting uh, uh, example in this is um, um, people are running um, uh, squats, we would maybe call them in English, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, um, so uh, there are um, some Im Im important experiences of uh, uh, families, uh, migrants, uh, uh, poor people, um, 
occupying a, a building and making it uh, um, a home, a collective, uh, uh, a collective home. So um, um, it, uh, it it follows two very different uh, um, <laughs> political and decision making codes because they are uh, uh, an antagonists and rule breakers uh, in towards the outside. Uh, but uh, they are giving themselves, uh, usually, importantly, um, a very um, structured uh, uh, and careful decision-making processes and uh, organization of the work inside. Uh, um, exactly this kind of um, um, experiences of uh, occupations on the political fringe uh, um, are now part of some of the best local networks in the poor neighborhoods uh, uh, of Rome uh, because um, uh, people kind of um, informal leaders uh, of uh, um, such um, informal uh, groupings uh, actually as uh, um, antagonists of uh, mm -hmm. local institutional structures uh, are um, um, the frontline um, informal volunteers organizing the uh, food delivery and uh, uh, taking care of uh, of the whole uh, of the whole neighborhood. So. Oh, thank you so much. It, yeah, sorry, it was on you go. Interesting. All right. So, listen, we've only got um, four minutes before we finish. So I'm going to ask both of you, Stuart and Ksenia, are there, do you have any thoughts about how this phenomenon will play out after the pandemic? That's one of the questions that one of the participants has put to us. And do you have maybe two or three really important uh, guidance points or thoughts that you, let's say wishes, let me give you three wishes. Do you have three wishes for what can arise from this into the future? So what do you think is going to happen and what are your three wishes for the future? No pressure. Thanks, George. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just um, for anyone, I suppose, that's, that's coming new to volunteer management, uh, we, we've got a resource around the four steps of volunteer management. So we have really pared that back. There's four little short little videos. If anyone wants to have a look at those, um, you can you can go to our website. It's volunteer.ie. But the one thing I would say, I suppose, is putting the volunteer at, at the center. Um, that's who we've got to focus on and, and realizing that there's mm. got to be give and take um, with the person who is the volunteer. And if we can focus on that, it has to be a win-win relationship for both. I think there needs to be and I think this is still developing, uh, is, is a better relationship and a better understanding of informal volunteering. When you talk about sometimes things like micro-volunteering or virtual volunteering and people sometimes that are stuck in very formal volunteering, they go, no, no, that's not a real thing. You talk about slacktivism, people go, that's not really volunteering. And whether you think it's volunteering or not, the thing is, it is a route into formal volunteering. Mm. So we've got to, I think, ourselves and say, I don't think we can continue into the future and say, well, here are all our rules and nor should we, we have safeguarding and we have protection there and we have volunteer management there. But I think we've got to start listening to informal volunteers, hear what, what they're looking for. Why, you know, if we go back to last October, November, they, they weren't interested in volunteering. So what was it that was stopping them then that now that they're keen and interested, is it that they don't want the bureaucracy or how can we help them? And that's that's what we've got to do. Well, thank you, Stuart. And what's your what's your top wish then for the future? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I suppose it, it, I don't think things are going to return to the way that they are, but I think we've got to be more open, listening and understanding of each other. And I, I think when I always come on these things, I always I always find it interesting to hear what's going on in other places of the world. And I think right now the world has become mm. a much smaller place. Is that people would often say, "Oh, there's much more informal volunteering going on here," or "There's much more of this going on there." 
this is probably well it is the first time in my lifehood and i'm sure everyone that's on today that we're all you know this isn't just one part of the world that's suffering from this we're all in the same boat at the moment so we've all got so much to learn from each other so there's no experts that are out there i think it's really good and it's an opportunity like this is to share and hear from other people and hear how they're reacting how are things are happening for them it's interesting um I know our colleagues in, in Volunteer New Zealand um, and some of the volunteer centres there are looking at a mechanism to support organisations coming out of uh, COVID-19. So encourage them around those plans. And that's that's what I would like to be thinking to be doing. Well said, Stuart. Thank you. Ksenia, have you got any well, top wishes for the future? Well, this thing of uh, doing without labels, uh, uh, and uh, as um, paramount important, talk to people, talk to people, talk to people, uh, without um, pushing them in, in boxes. My wish mm. is, no, I, I, I believe that um, uh, volunteering is a way of expressing your own individual uh, freedom. Uh, and um, my wish would be that uh, every person could have the opportunity to could afford herself in self the pleasure to have a, a bit of self determination to do something that is important to her and him. This is uh, uh, what I see that volunteering uh, that would be my wish. Those are wonderful words, Ksenia, and it makes it so easy for me then to wrap things up, just to follow, to fully endorse what you've said. Um, to thank yourself and Stuart and Reda and Ayavi for uh, setting this up. Um, I hope that all the participants have found this worthwhile. There will be follow-up information available to you. And all I wish now to say, my wish, is that everybody is safe and that you see your way through this and that we'll have another opportunity before too long to talk again. <clears throat> so thank you, everybody. Um, as your moderator, it is now the end of the meeting, and I wish you all very well. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, George, Senya, and um, and Stuart. We just no want to remind you that we are here to help. Ayave has started a series of webinars, and as, as well as our COVID-19 fund, please go to iava.org slash COVID-19 and learn more about these, um, these efforts. We want to hear from you. We want to hear about the things that you're doing in your organizations. And please join us. IAVA is an organization that connects with volunteer, volunteer organizations of all types everywhere in the world. And we're only stronger if you are part of our organization. So please join us, follow us on social media, and let us know what you're doing in these troubling times and always. Thank you all for being here. To our moderator and our presenters, thank you for your very important insights and we'll see you soon.